Thank you for joining us for the DC Community Heritage Project, our neighborhoods, our stories, our voices. I'm Mark Smith, the Humanities Council of Washington, DC. I'll be your host, as the DC Community Heritage Project features three projects from recent grantees. We'll bring you the stories from your community as we preserve the rich history of Washington, DC. All of these projects originated right here in the District of Columbia and were supported and funded in part by the Humanities Council and the DC Historic Preservation Office through its grant from the National Park Service. Our first featured story takes us into the heart of a black church that was founded in the 1800s and is still a powerful voice in Washington, DC, 148 years later. Uh, my name is Keith William Bird, Sr. Um, I have, am currently the pastor of Zion Baptist Church and uh, will be seven years this December. Uh, those saintly seven, we often refer them as to them, they came up from Fredericksburg. Uh, it, it ended up being around 13 or 14 people that actually organized the church under the first pastor, Reverend William Walker. But one of the things that they would wanted to really do is education. And in this sanctuary, I don't know if you'll get an opportunity to see above us, part of our mission statement still bears education. They came with an understanding that they needed education to further advance themselves. So the very first thing that was started in Zion Baptist Church was its Sunday school. And the Sunday school not only taught the Bible, but it taught reading, writing, and arithmetic. And so very early on in the community, the Southwest community that you hear so much about, our first site was a feed store on F Street in Southwest Washington. The community would come around to learn, not just Bible, but to learn how to read, to learn how to write. And so Zion became a force for advancing people so that they could take advantages of the, the new stuff that was available to folks who were coming from the South to the North. Uh, my pastor refers to DC as the up South, but coming up uh, to the North to really take advantage of those opportunities. And Zion from its inception, the people have always believed that education is the key. My name is Ida Jones, uh, PhD. I'm here on the grant they received from the DC Community Humanities Society, and I'm working as an archivist and consultant for them. So when you find the Baptist Church in particular, like other black denominations, started schools, elementary schools, high schools, and colleges, and they were able to kind of facilitate the learning process, which we've always looked, overlooked with black churches. So we get caught up in the grandeur and the pageantry of, of, of the leadership or the, of the pastor, pastorate, but the early black church's education, citizenship, patriotism, all of these things are inculcated from generation to generation. And we've gotten away from understanding that, but we need to kind of refresh our minds on that. Zion has served as a place where people can learn how to live, how to uh, be exposed to things that they may not otherwise be exposed to. It's almost like Zion operated as a finishing school in a, in a real sense for many of those early folks who came through Zion Baptist Church. They learned how to exist in society. They learned how to, you know, the place settings, all of those things. If you look at early pictures of Zion Baptist Church and look at the Sunday school, look at how the young ladies were dressed. Look at how the young men were dressed. It was really a preparatory kind of environment for them to go out and lead productive lives. We're seeing a tremendous, tremendous outpouring of interest and celebration for this project. Um, it has been ongoing for the last couple of years uh, and we've tried to keep the congregation informed, but many of the people who come to Zion Baptist Church come first seeking God and that, that, that will never change. And as they see God, it's important to understand what has been not only the theological history of the church, but what has been the sociological history of Zion Baptist Church. And as we teach and train, then people become more engaged with the mission because they understand how it evolved. It just didn't happen last year. It didn't happen 10 years ago. It's a mission that really started in the mind of God and was deposited in seven people who, who journeyed here and they, they have called this place Zion, the city of God. And, and we have a member of our church, Deacon Regina Tolson Rutledge, whom you've uh, interviewed already, who often talks about Zion is calling us to a higher place of praise. And that is our song, we sing it often. And what that does for people 
is it inspires them. And the inspiration is real when they know the history from whence it comes. And so our people are very excited. The congregation is very interested and very motivated and are celebrating what Zion was, what Zion is, and what Zion is yet to become. Uh, my name is Sarah Davidson. I have been a member of Zion Baptist Church since 1987. Uh, most recently, I served as historian of Zion Baptist Church. From researchers and people who are doing historical research, years from the day know that the black church made a difference. They need to know that the black church was at the table, that the black church just didn't make a difference spiritually, but it made a difference from a sociological point of view, a psychological point of view, an economic point of view, a historical point of view. And I think that if we don't share that history, no one will know that we've made a difference. And I envision 100 years from now that when people are doing research on African-American history, Zion Baptist Church will be at the front in terms of what it was like to be an African-American from 1864 up until whenever we stop our history. So it's very important that we document that history. We've had uh, Jimmy Carter and Reverend Martin Luther King Sr., Dr. King's father, uh, and most recently this year, we had President Barack Obama to visit our church. His family came here. So Zion has really been involved locally, nationally, and internationally. And I might say also that one of our members, we interviewed her in our booklet, Judith, Al Judith Allen, uh, she trained the opera singer uh, Denise Graves. And Denise did her piano practice here. Uh, the Culture Club adopted her, helped pay for her college education. Uh, so we really reach out to the community to help people out and we've made a big difference in terms of helping out at all levels of society. I was, I was a member here, but I was not aware of the history. And to me, it was just so exciting. When I did the oral interviews, I could, uh, Arnold Pryor talked about all the different churches in Southwest and how on Sunday people would be walking east, west, north, south, all different directions, going to the black churches. You didn't know what church someone belonged to because they went to all the different churches, you know. And I could visualize being there. Well, I've met several of the mature women here in the congregation who pointed to pictures of themselves from the 50s and the 40s. And some of these women actually have parents and grandparents who are members of the congregation so they can point back to their pre-existence. So I think seeing the photographs and hearing the narratives have been very inspirational. And then actually one woman has a granddaughter who was here and she emptied a program with Denise Graves. So to have five or six generations of one family in a local congregation is incredible on a number of levels. So it's both documentary and human. All the people different social classes of the black community were all in the church together and they were one and they were all about uplifting the races and I could feel it, I could see it when I read the interview. It was an awesome experience doing this project. To see when this and other shows are airing on DCTV, log on to dctv.org and click view full schedule. You can also watch DCTV live on the internet 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, no matter where you are. DCTV, anytime, anywhere. When some people struggle with their mortgage payments, they become frozen, petrified. Not knowing what to do, they do nothing. But the people who take action are far more likely to get the most positive outcome. Making home affordable is a free government program. Call now to talk one-on-one -on -one with a housing expert about the options that are right for you. Real help, real answers, right now. Welcome back to the DC Community Heritage Project, our neighborhood, our stories, our voices, the show that profiles our neighborhoods, tells our stories, and gives a voice to the past, present, and future of Washington, DC. Our next feature project tells us about a controversial community deeply rooted in the fiber of Washington, D.C. So we're right here in a, a historical community. We're right here in Berry Farm, uh, which used to be Hillsdale, which used to be the Berry Plantation. It is in Anacostia, which is in Ward 8, Washington, D.C. Uh, it's right next to the Anacostia Metro Station. It's bordering the Anacostia River. 
There's a lot of new development and revitalization going on, and uh, it's a place that you should definitely come see uh, right now, and it's a definitely uh, a place that you might want to look towards to in the future. Um, executive producer of the uh, People Past and Present Hillsdale documentary, which I might change back to Berry Farm Past and Present as I was uh, advised by one of my colleagues, who happens to be a well-known historian, uh, C.R. Gibbs, who feels like uh, that name has a lot more, you know, national recognition and significance, which I agree, which I agree. Well, after this emancipation, there was still no social economic structure for the freedmen. So you have a situation where there's shanty towns that people live in and alleyways. It's, it's no support for these men. So General Howard uh, was commissioned um, by the, um, well, he was, he was trying to, he was supposed to be employed by President Lincoln, but President Lincoln actually died before uh, General Howard was appointed. General Howard took the reins of the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, this was an attempt by the federal government to deal with the ills of freedmen, uh, represent them in legal cases, and uh, he, extend, he also had a vision to provide land for them. So he purchased uh, the Berry Plantation, which we now know as Berry Farm. It was a tobacco plantation. It was about 375 acres of land. Freedmen settled here. They often purchased one acre lots. Uh, by purchasing these lots, that money went to go fund uh, a part of the, the, the founding of Howard University in which General Howard was uh, on the board of directors. The school is named after him. What was good um, and interesting about that is Howard University actually came to Berry Farm. Um, and I did take some of the conversations there, but they actually came to Berry Farm and they engaged with the community based on the fact that this community is a, is a remnant of a community who helped found Howard University and helped establish the institution. They didn't necessarily like General Howard helping them out too much. They did, you know, uh, accuse him of misappropriation. But he told the story of a young man who walked from Berry Farm seven miles every day to Howard University to educate himself. And there were many examples of that. These men built a, a community while going home, you know, after long days of work, working downtown, walking back and forth, no electricity, built these homes and A-frame homes and the candlelight with axes, shovels, picks, holes, hammers, nails, very primitive tools. But after being to work all day, they came home from work to work on building their homes. And some of the people that you get out of the story, like Solomon G. Brown, who was the uh, first African-American to actually uh, represent D.C. in the um, first territorial government from 1871 to 1874. He was, um, became a, a poet. He was a, a scientist. He was a paleontologist. He uh, was the first black employee of the Smithsonian, and he helped lay the first telephone lines from D.C. to Baltimore, working with uh, the guy, uh, Morse, who invented the Morse code. So you can see the hard work, you can see integrity. Family was very important. There were solid family structures where people had, um, you know, a, uh, a, a moral values and things that didn't cause people to want to hurt each other, and harm each other, and steal from each other all the time. I think that the families back then were more tightly knit. Uh, their values were a little more uh, sustainable. They had a lot more substance. Well, the gentrification process that's been taking case here uh, in Ward A period is uh, very similar to any Hope Six, you know, program. Now you have new communities. Is uh, a, a effort for the government to kind of engage the community a lot more than they have in the past. Uh, there's been an effort and actually there has been residents from Berry Farm who have actually began to move to Sheridan Terrace, which is a new modern contemporary uh, architectural uh, home housing site. And uh, there are many residents who began moving over there already. I, I, I got in tune with the Humanities Council uh, through Patsy Flesher, um, who was actually in the documentary. And uh, she told me to check them out. I checked them out. I uh, got to uh, meet uh, Joy um, eventually, who is a, a, just a beautiful spirit. And uh, they were very supportive of my project. Uh, they understood the situation at Berry Farm. This goes back to cultural competency. 
um, you know, and they were supportive. So if you're not telling your story for yourself, whoever's telling your story for you may tell it in their best interest instead of, your, instead of yours. So learn your story and tell your story and learn your story based on the research that you do. And uh, make sure your story is understood in a way that actually makes you feel good about yourself. Up, college is hard, down, those books are heavy. My sport is football, but my passion is education. Right up so every year I take promising high schoolers on a college tour there, to show them that higher education means a brighter future. <laughs> My name is Namdi Asamoa. I don't just wear the shirt, I live it. Find out how you can live United for Education. Give, advocate, volunteer. Go to liveunited.org. Do you wear this? Welcome back. I'm Mark Smith and I've been your host as the DC Community Heritage Project features worthy grant recipients and the projects they hold dear to their heart. DC is known for its distinctive architecture. While we might hear of some of the more renowned architects, there are other designers who contributed to the look and feel of Washington, but have rarely been credited. Let's take a look. Master Builders came about as a result of having worked in the library and archives at the American Institute of Architects. The Humanities Council was extremely helpful. The Humanities Council provided the grant funding for um, the documentary, a portion of the grant funding. And most importantly, they provided me with the um, support Washington, D.C. is home to numerous buildings designed by pioneering African-American architects. According to the Washington chapter of the American Institute of Architects, in 1875, only nine men were listed as architects in the Washington City Directory. By 1879, there were 29 listings, and in 1892, 70 architectural firms were in business in the district. Calvin Thomas Stowe Brent was the first acknowledged African-American architect practicing in Washington, D.C. in the last quarter of the 19th century. Of all of the building types, I fell in love with the churches. And um, one in particular was definitely Calvin Brent's um, church, uh, Third Street Baptist Church. I visited the church um, and looking at the stained glass and looking at the, um, the pews and I just imagined myself back in um, the late 1800s and how, you know, you know African Americans would marvel at coming to church and I just felt their spirit throughout that church because um, it, you just have to go inside and just reminisce about what these people did to put this church, have this church built, and uh, the pride they took in having it built. African American Architects, a biographical dictionary, 1865 to 1945, was published in 2004. It is the first scholarly work that chronicles pioneering African American architects in the United States. That resource is what I used as well for my um, documentary. You have one architect alone, Louis Giles Sr., who is on record for having over a thousand buildings built. In Washington, D.C., the first three African-American registered architects were John Langford, Romulus Archer Jr., and Albert Irvin Cassell. Each year, I would wait for a film relating to African-American architects. And one year, a film did come through the collection, and that was it. We had lost a lot of uh, landmarks that were associated with African-Americans. We didn't have information that could be used to identify them, and community groups that would come forward with nominations very often couldn't meet technical requirements that they needed to meet in order to have the buildings listed. There is an old adage that says, if not you, then who, if not now, then when. 
and the win for me came about in 2007 and I said okay it has to be done I, so I set about making this film on African-American architects information is there it was not difficult at all you have to have the tenacity to continue to dig. Um, I started in 2008, and um, during that time, you, I lost jobs, I lost family members, um, just a whole gamut. It was life. The community's um, reaction as well as the industry um, reaction has been, yes, it's about time. Uh, this story needs to be told. Um, so they have been just, they've been supportive as well. The next step is to uh, participate in as many community forums as possible. When you're talking about future generations, um, they need to know what was done um, before and, and where they are now. And that's what I hope the film does. And I hope the film will encourage other filmmakers to, to look at their environment and look at, uh, and, and really um, just see that there's, there's a story to be told behind here. My, my um, suggestion, if you have a passion and it won't go away, then it is for you and to do it. And you will, even when you get weary, God will give you strength to see it through. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs, and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Well, I hope you enjoyed our community stories. The DC Community Heritage Project began in 2005 to explore the social and cultural history of DC neighborhoods from the perspective of longtime residents. Jointly sponsored by the DC. DC Historic Preservation Office and the Humanities Council of Washington, DC, the DC Community Heritage Project puts the power of community history where it belongs, in the hands of residents, by providing information, training, grants up to $2,000, and a venue through which to showcase the rewards of their studies. The results have been increased interest in social and cultural history of DC neighborhoods, a developing body of documented histories available to the public, but best of all, a sense of investment in the preservation and future development of DC's rich community heritage. Information about the DC CHP may be found through the Humanities Council website at wdchumanities.org or the DC Preservation Office website at planning.dc.gov. Click on Historic Preservation, then on the DC History icon. Interested persons may also contact Mark Smith at 202-387-8391, or you can email me at msmith at wdchumanities.org. You may also contact Patsy Fletcher at 202-741-0816, or you can email her at patsy.fletcher at dc.gov. Thank you for joining us for the DC Community Heritage Project, our neighborhoods, our stories, our voices. Thank you.